Hello and welcome to the Bible for Worship at St. Paul Lutheran Church on this 11th Sunday after Pentecost, when our Gospel reading is written in Matthew, the 14th chapter, verses 22 through 33. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story of Jesus walking on the sea, walking on the water, and Peter, at Jesus' invitation, walking on water as well. It's a familiar image, of course. Walking on water has become a proverbial way of talking about somebody who can do wonders, who is somehow superhuman, and with good reason, because we see, for example, in the book of Job, chapter 9, verse 8, that it is God who stretched the heavens and who trod the waves of the sea. If we look beyond ancient Israel's traditions around the Mediterranean world, we see that it is only gods who really have this power to walk on the sea. The sea in many ways as a symbol of that chaotic, threatening depth that could overwhelm the entire world, as, for example, the flood story suggests. And in a Babylonian flood story, uh, the Gilgamesh epic, Gilgamesh is a human character who can walk on water, but only because the power of divine magic has been given to him. And in other Mediterranean cultures, there are individuals who may be able to walk on water because they are so close to divine. They are kind of divine people without yet really being gods. And perhaps they too have this power. Well, Jesus goes on and even more explicitly identifies himself as being divine when he says to the disciples, it is I, fear not. It is I is one of the ways that God identifies God's self to Israel in the Old Testament, in the Jewish Bible. When God first introduces God's self to Moses, and Moses says, well, what is your name? It, it's in many ways, God says, well, I am. 
And in fact, the personal name of God seems to be a variant on that statement of I am. And fear not, this is God's regular response to those who encounter God, whether it's Moses with the fiery bush or whether it's one of the prophets when they're commanded and commissioned to be a prophet. When they encounter God, God's first reassuring comfort to them is fear not. And so both in the ability of Jesus to walk on the water and also in these words of Jesus that Ma Matthew reports, Matthew says Jesus is a divine being, a son of God. Well, that shouldn't surprise us in Matthew because it is the way that he introduces his whole gospel in chapter 1, 1, that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ, the Son of God. Again, in chapter 16, uh, it, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Um, God has already at the baptism said, you are my beloved son, making Jesus a son of God. And at the crucial moment of Jesus' death in the crucifixion, the centurion looking on says, truly, this was God's son. So the idea of Jesus as son of God and every king of Israel, who was a messianic figure, in fact, uh, every king of Israel uh, was understood to be a son of God. And this all reaffirms that about Jesus for Matthew's community. But there's more. Because while this story of Jesus walking on water is very curiously present in both Mark and John's gospel, now that's an odd combination in the New Testament, to have something that Matthew, Mark, and John all have as part of their story, and Luke doesn't. This is a very unusual combination of sources. But in addition to this walking on water story that Matthew, Mark, and John all have, Matthew alone introduces into the middle of it this story about Peter in the boat calling out to Jesus, if it's you, command me to come to you. And then the vignette that follows. Now, we know that Peter is not divine. Peter is not a son of God. Peter is one of the people of God, although we will find out in chapter 16 when Jesus says, on this rock, Petros, Peter, I will build my church. He is foundational to the people of God, and in a sense, he is representative of the people of God, representative of you and me as people of God. And there's a very interesting Buddhist tale that parallels Peter's walking on the water. It's about a fellow named Jatakas, who is on an, an eager, enthusiastic pilgrimage journey. And he comes to a river, and he begins to cross the river. But when he takes his mind off the teachings of the Buddha and notices the river and its current and its waves and such, he begins to sink in the river. But then returning his focus to the thoughts of the Buddha and the teachings of the Buddha, Jatakas regains his footing and finishes crossing the river. A really interesting, deeply, deeply, this is the closest parallel we have to this story of Peter anywhere in ancient world literature, and how fascinating that it comes from a Buddhist source. Um, is this a common tradition that may have circulated on caravan routes with the traders who crossed the deserts and shared their stories by campfire and the like? Who knows? But there is the parallel. But we don't have to go to Buddhist tradition to ask where Matthew might have gotten this. 
because it's also deeply embedded in Matthew's tradition, the tradition of biblical Israel. The cry of Peter can already be heard in Psalm 69, where the psalmist says, I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. Do not let the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up, the psalmist says, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. That from Psalm 69, which also provides a whole host of phrases, languages, images that the gospel writers used to depict the story of Jesus' passion as well. And if the cry that Peter utters can be heard as an echo of Psalm 69, God's response, Jesus' response, can be heard as an echo of Psalms 107. When they cried to the Lord in their trouble, he brought them out from their distress. God brought them out. God made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet and God brought them to their desired haven. This is who Matthew says Jesus is. A figure who brings God into the living experience of Matthew's community in the figure of Peter and the other disciples. And when these two stories are brought together, Jesus walking on the water, establishing his credentials as son of God, and able to still the storms, the storms of life, combine that with Peter seeking to have that faith, seeking to have that focus, seeking to have that trust, as we all do, that allows us to walk on water. By bringing those together in this way, Matthew helps us understand that in the community of Jesus, it's not that troubles and fear and doubt don't exist. They are very real. The storms are really there and they can push our little boats far from the security of any shore. But the response is not simply to know the end of the story and so hunker down, maybe cover our heads and wait for it all to pass. But rather the response as Matthew shows us in Peter, is to look for Jesus, to reach out, to listen, and to follow, and still in the midst of the storm, to be God's people. After all, this is Matthew, who has recorded as the very first of Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, that those who follow Jesus are blessed even when people revile and persecute you for his name's sake. And yet Matthew turns from that to say that you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. Don't hide that light under a bushel even when the storms break out and people revile you. You know the end of the story. Jesus' hand is there to steady you as you step out, even in fear and doubt. And so, in the midst of everything, you can be salt for the world and light for the world as Jesus' people 
as God's people. God bless.